All righty. Well, let's all stand real quick in honor of the Word of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. All right. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read verse 10 through 13. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read verse 10 through 13. I'm just going to read this as you can follow along. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, once again for the opportunity to be in the house of God. May you bless now, Lord, our time together. Bless, Lord, the service. May you, Lord, do a special and a mighty work. May you speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, I just pray that, Lord, it would uh, be a blessing. Lord God, I love you. Thank you so much for allowing me to preach. Lord, I'm a sinner. And, Lord, I don't deserve to be, Lord, behind this pulpit. I don't deserve a chance, Lord, to be able to serve you, God. But thank you for giving me a home in heaven, Lord Jesus, giving me salvation and giving me an opportunity to preach the word of God and to be a pastor, Lord, I thank you so much. Thank you for the, Lord, my beautiful wife that, Lord, you've given to me, Lord. Thank you for a beautiful little girl. Thank you, Lord, for a great church. Lord God, all the blessings that you've given to me, Lord God, that I don't deserve, I pray that you'd please would just help me, Lord, to now just preach the word of God. May you just please, Holy Spirit, do a work that only you can do, and may you just do one, uh, just bless one more time in my life, and Lord, we'll be sure to give you the honor and the glory and the praise for all that you do. Thank you, Lord, so much for loving us, and thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Forgive us for where we fail you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. Uh, before, we, uh, before we get in quite into the message, I just, uh, I didn't say enough about it this morning, and I, and I felt bad, but I wanted to make sure to uh, thank those, uh, those in the room that are, are veterans and those that have served in the military. Uh, we say happy Memorial Day, uh, and it is a happy time. We celebrate partly the freedom of our country, but it's also a, a sad reminder of all the lives that have been lost in our country. And so I, for those of you that have served I wanted to make sure to say uh, publicly thank you for your service and thank you for giving us freedom. Uh, we wouldn't be able to gather and have, a, have the freedom in our churches, amen, without men that have served and given their life for our country. So thank you very much. And I plan to uh, have uh, something for, the, uh, uh, for the, like Veterans Day and things like that. And then uh, but Memorial Day, it, it just slipped right underneath me and I did not take the time. And I don't, I don't believe you can honor your military too much. Amen. So thank you, men. And uh, we definitely appreciate it. Many of you have given, uh, given much for this country. And so I appreciate that. In light of Memorial Day, though, I was thinking and praying. And it reminded me uh, just how much of a sacrifice that has been given to our country. I'd like you to uh, just real quick, before I do get in the message, just listen. I've got some facts and things. I love to study. I love facts. I love... History, uh, I, I love all of that, and to get, I, I love to learn uh, about wars and, and great generals and uh, just many things, that, uh, just things I, I enjoy reading and getting to see. It's kind of like um, uh, something maybe you're not familiar with, but General uh, MacArthur, that the one that stood on the banks of the Philippines and said, I will return. You know, the, the track, have you ever heard of the track, God's Simple Plan of Salvation? If many of you maybe have never heard of that. It's a track was written by a man named Dr. Ford Porter. Dr. Ford Porter was a missionary, or a, a, a sorry, in a, a preacher slash kind of evangelist uh, years ago, years ago, and uh, he pastored a few churches. But he prayed and he said, "Lord, I want to, I want a worldwide ministry." He said, "Lord, I want to do something that." Uh, would affect the world. And he said, and I don't want the glory for it. He said, I'll put your name on it and I'll give you the honor and glory and praise. He said, but I want to do something that affects the world. And uh, he prayed for that for years, year after year after year after year. Uh, finally, he got a burden because the people in his neighborhood he was giving some tracks to and inviting people to church and he didn't like the tracks he was giving. So he wrote his own called God's Simple Plan of Salvation. From that track, 
It has gone into many different languages, hundreds of thousands of tracks all over the world, and one of those tracks got into the hands of General Douglas MacArthur. And he read that track and got saved. And he went to his entire military staff and he said, I just read this, men, and I want you to make the same decision. And he read that track out loud to the men of his staff. Boy, and that's stuff I like to read. I love history. So that was really neat. I was like, wow, reading a book. Well, so there's, uh, in, in, in light of Memorial Day, so I looked up just some different things of uh, different wars. And some of this maybe you've heard before, uh, but I wanted to point out a few things. Uh, this is just st statistics from many of the major wars. These are the uh, deaths and casualties from many of the major wars in America that we fought and that we recognize on Memorial Day. Uh, we start with the War of 1812. There was a total of 20,000 casualties. Then you move on to the Civil War, where that was the war between the North and the South. There was 750,000 casualties. World War I was a total of 320,518 casualties. That's including deaths and wounded. Uh, 3,350 went missing. World War II, there was a total of 1,076,245 casualties. 30,314 went missing. In the Korean War, there was 128,680 uh, casualties. 4,789 missing. Vietnam War, there was 211,454 uh, casualties, 2,489 went missing. In the Afghanistan War, not just too long ago, 20,904 casualties, no missing. In the Iraq War, there was 36,710 uh, casualties and two missing uh, as of right now. Total deaths in all of these wars combined equal a 1,354,664 deaths. Total casualties comes to 2,852,901 casualties total. That includes being wounded, losing an arm, losing whatever it may be. So this Memorial Day, I would encourage you find a veteran and tell them thank you. Amen. Put your hand in theirs and just tell, or somebody that serves in the military, tell them thank you. One of the funniest things, though, that you can learn from this, though, and uh, you can learn a spiritual truth here, is that the war that we had the most deaths in, not casualties, but the war that most, the most deaths were recorded was the Civil War. The war between the states caused more deaths than any other war in history. What's the Bible say that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand? There was more damage done to the United States in between themselves than, other, than any other country could actually inflict upon us. So if I learn a spiritual truth from statistics and from history and from the men of the past, if we're not careful, we'll do more damage and we'll destroy more of our country within our country than we will what somebody else can do to us. Boy, we can survive any war, but this country can't survive if we don't have a strong within. Amen. If us as individuals. And it reminds me of a church. I encourage us as church that we can withstand any storm that comes our way together. Banding together, standing for God, we can withstand anything that comes our way. But let's be careful that we don't allow ourselves to be destroyed from within. Because that can, that can cause the most damage. And that's just... Again, something I learned, something that I, I just, the Lord brought to my mind. Don't allow the devil to come and destroy us from within because that can cause more damage than the devil simply trying to get us from without. Same in your home. You can withstand any weather, anybody come your way, try to destroy your home. You can take it. Husband and wife stand together. You can weather that storm. But the devil get in between a husband and wife, the home will fall apart. So be careful. Don't allow the devil to get to the inside, to get within. Amen. Which leads me to the message. In Ephesians chapter 6, we have an unseen war that Paul warns us about. We'll be very quick tonight. It's not very long at all. But there's an unseen war that Paul tells the Ephesians here. And we see in verse 10, he says, the very first thing here is he says, Finally. 
This is the last thing that Paul has to say to the Ephesians. This is uh, relatively the last thought that he's going to portray to them. He says, finally, after everything that we've covered, after everything that we've said, he says, we come down to this. We come down to this last final thought that he wants to leave with us. He tells the Ephesians, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why does a Christian need armor? Why does a Christian have to stand? Because there's a battle that's raging. There's a battle that's going on and we have to put on this armor. Paul says, you may not understand, you may not see it, but there's a battle. There's something going on. Yes, there's wars and rumors of wars in this world, but he tells us as a Christian, there's a greater battle that we're against. There's a greater enemy that we fight on a daily basis. There's a greater enemy that your home is being attacked by. There's a greater foe that you may, may not be able to see, but the battle is still there. But notice he says first, he says, finally, my brethren, this is to the saved. If you're saved this, this evening, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you've been enlisted in this unseen war. You don't realize it, but when you got saved, Jesus wrote your name in the book of life. Praise God, heaven's your home. But that also enlisted you into this battle. You're in a war. You may not, even it, whether you like it or not, we're in a battle now against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Anybody that stands with God is now against the devil. And the devil's going to fight hard against. Now, I already preached not too long ago about being a fighter. So we're not going to go over the same concepts. But I'd like you to see what Paul tells us. He says, finally, my brethren. So to the saved, you're born again. You've accepted Jesus as your Savior. To the brethren, what's he say? Be strong in the Lord. What does Paul mean? Why does he encourage them? Be strong. Well, many soldiers are physically fit. Many soldiers are required to, be, to exercise, to be physically strong, so that they can bear the, uh, bear the weight of battle. But many soldiers are also strong mentally. They have much they have to learn, much that they have to accomplish. They have to be strong in their field of knowledge to know their weapons and know their tactics. In this unseen war that you and I fight as a Christian, we have to be strong, and God narrows it down, not just be strong... We don't have to just, it's not just be, talking about being buff, like your pastor. <laughs> don't laugh, Sarah, that's not fair. No. It's not talking about being physically fit. As I uh, ran the other day, uh, my brother was holding Adeline, and, uh, and so I uh, let him walk a little bit away, and then I ran and snuck up on her and stuff. Well, I was, I'm out of shape. <laughs> I was like, I'm only 25. I was, whew, whew, I was running after her. So it's a good thing. We don't have to be, it's not talking about physically fit. Look what he says. He says, be strong in the Lord. So this unseen battle that you face, God tells you he wants you to be strong, but he wants you to be strong in the Lord. In other words, be strong in your knowledge of God. Be strong in your knowledge of God's Word. Be strong in your Bible reading. Be strong, be, be rooted, be deep, be strong, be held fast to the Lord, to the Word of God. Exercise and get strong in understanding and knowing the Bible. Amen. Many Christians, sometimes we're strong in many things. But God says if we're going to fight this battle effectively, if we're going to fight this battle that we're in uh, and, and get something done, we're going to have to be strong in the Lord. You're going to have to get in your Bible like never before so that the devil doesn't toss you about with every wind of doctrine and be strong in your faith that's in Christ Jesus. A lot of times casualties come because we're not strong. The Jehovah's Witness come by and they sway you to believe something anti-Scripture. Why does that come? How does that come about? Because we're not strong in the Lord. As a Christian, we're to be busy trying to make ourselves and trying to, in, in, and trying to exercise ourselves to be strong 
in understanding God's Word? Do you know what you believe? Do you know why? If not, ask. Amen. We can help. I can help you to be strong, to know what you believe, why we believe it, where is it in God's Word. Why is that so important? Because the devil is after you in a battle. He's trying to get you to fall and to crumble and be a casualty. But if you're strong, boy, you'll be able to stand. Be rooted and grounded in Christ. Take time to understand and know the Word of God. Read the Word of God as much as you can. Get as much of it in you as much as you can. Know why and ask questions, amen. Get, get a hold of God and say, God, why this and why that? And, and, and be willing to give it to the Lord. Boys, a lot of times in America we become strong in our knowledge of everything else but the Bible. Amen. America's become strong in everything. Like what Brother Dotson pointed out today, Tar Target no longer sells the Bible. You know why? They don't want people to be strong in the Lord. If people got strong in the Lord, they'd no longer shop at Target. <laughs> Target's, uh, the Bible's the very book that condemns them. Of course they're not going to sell it. That's how the devil is. The devil wants to get the Bible out of your home, the Bible out of your life, the Bible out of everything you do. Why? Because if you're, this is how you become strong in the Lord. The less Bible you have, the less of a Christian you'll be. The more Bible you have, the more of a Christian you'll be. And the devil knows that he can win the battle. The devil can get the upper hand if you're not strong in the Lord. Don't let the devil convince you to uh, increase your knowledge in anything else but God's Word. Amen. If it's outside of God's Word, if you find something, you begin to read something that you say, you know, that doesn't quite line up with the Word of God, put it away. Don't read it. Amen. Don't get into this watchtower. Don't get into uh, the horoscope and all of this, all these things that are out there. You stay within God's Word. Amen. And I promise you, you'll be just fine. Don't become strong in anything else. Boy, sometimes teenagers and young people begin to be more, they're more strong in knowing actors. Boy, the average teenager, you walk up and you ask him, hey, what did Moses do? Uh, then you say, hey, who's, uh, I don't know, I've been on a Justin Bieber thing lately, so we'll say Justin Bieber. <laughs> Hey, who's Justin Bieber? Oh, he sings this song, this song, this song. He was born this day. He likes this. Uh, uh, his hair is this color. His eyes are this color. You think I'm crazy. They, they know all this stuff. They, they put it out there. Why? I don't know. I don't want to know the, the kid's color of his eyes and hair. And I mean, what do I want to care for? I'd like to punch him in the nose, amen, because he looks like a girl. But, uh, amen. But you know what? Our generations become strong in their knowledge of everything else. Boy, let's work at training up our children to be strong in the knowledge of God. Let's train our children to be strong in understanding and knowing the Bible. Don't let your children be, uh, be get to where they know actors in movies better than they know the Word of God. Amen. That's why America is the way she is. Because the president can get up and sign a bill into law that says we'll let transgender bathrooms be in place and nobody really care. You know why? Nobody's strong in the Lord. Let's be strong. Amen. Let's take time to work at every day in our walk with God to become stronger and stronger in the Lord. Exercise those spiritual muscles, so to speak. Become, become buff in the Word of God. Amen. If I can use that term. Be a buff Christian and uh, I'm going to get a suit. My brother used to have a, we did a play one time, or a skit for Vacation Bible School, and he was called Super Christian. And, uh, and my brother Mitchell, if you've ever, when he was younger, he didn't weigh more than 50 pounds, and that's when he was wet. And he was just a skinny pole. And we got him this suit, and it was a Superman suit, and it had its own little, you know, foam muscles and all this stuff. So he looked like this little twig, little leg, little arm, and this big old chest. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was funny. But you know, as a Christian, let's be strong in the Lord. I don't know why the Lord put that in my mind. And uh, Sorry, Lord. Amen. Moving on. Be strong in the Lord. And then look. And in the power of His might. Notice there it's twofold. We're to be strong in the Lord and to be strong in the power of His might. When you are strong in the Lord, when you 
focus in God's Word and allow yourself to become rooted and grounded in the Word of God, God's power can fall and you can be strong in the power of His might. Because as uh, Philippians uh, says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You see, to live the Christian life, we need God's power. We need God to bring the power of His might. We don't need our own power. We don't need the world's power. We don't need the power that comes from uh, any other source. We need the power of His might upon our lives. And the power of His might can fall after we're strong in the Lord. When you know what you believe, when you're in God's Word, when you're fervent in praying and strong in the Lord, what you'll find is God's power, His power can fall and rest upon your life and you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Notice how that when the devil comes and attacks, if you of yourself try to be strong, if you try to use your own power, you'll be knocked down. When the devil comes against your family, and you try to stick out your spiritual chest, but you're not strong in, in the Lord and God's power is not on your life, then the devil looks at you as easy prey. As a church, if we're not strong in God's Word and know what we believe, why we believe it, and get in God's Word and not be swayed with every wing of doctrine, then the devil knows that he can bring whatever he wants to. And we can stick out our spiritual chests, but he knows that there's no strength. Because of our own power, we cannot stand. Because to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, we have to be strong in the power of his might. We've got to have God. Your family won't last. Your children, your marriage, your home, our church, your Christian life will not last when the devil comes, comes his way as in the old wolf, he'll blow down and huff and puff and blow your house down. Why? You've built your life upon a shaky foundation. But if you'll spend time being strong in the Lord and get your children in the Word of God, then we can stand and God will give us His power, the power of His might. And boy, it doesn't matter what the devil brings our way. Amen. We may not be perfect, we are not always going to be what we should be. But being strong in the Lord doesn't mean that you have to be the best Christian. Doesn't mean you've got to be a Paul the Apostle. Doesn't mean you've got to be the pastor. It just means that you're a Christian that every day you're spending time in the Word of God and you know the Bible. And God's power can rest upon an everyday Christian. And the devil can try to bring what he may when you have this at your side because, and you've got God's power, boy, there's nothing that will take those legs out. Amen. Be strong in the Lord. We need God's power. When you pray, beg for God's power. Beg for the power of His might. Beg for God's help. Because when the devil decides to finally come your way and, you're not in, and you don't have that power, you don't have His might, then the devil's going to run right over us. Amen. Then next, put on the whole armor of God. Notice we have to make a decision. So we're strong in the Lord. God's power falls upon us. And then after that, we make a decision to put on the whole armor of God. See, the armor of God for a Christian does not come naturally. In other words, it's not just something you come equipped with. You have it available but God gives us a promise, or, a, or a, God gives us a challenge to put on the whole armor of God. It's kind of like when you get up in the morning. You have clothes, but you have to put them on. It's a decision, amen? Please make that decision. Put on. It's the same with the armor of God. You're going to get up every morning, and you can make a decision to either walk throughout your day without the armor, or you get in side your prayer life and you say, God, I need to put on the armor of God. It's a decision that you have to make to put on the whole armor of God. 
This can be done. I, I spend time in my prayer and, and, and Bible study, and I spend time asking God as I put on the armor of God. I say, Lord, I need the helmet of salvation today. I need the breastplate of righteousness. I need the sword of the Spirit. I need my loins girt about with truth and my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I claim every day the armor that God's promised to a Christian. Put it on. Amen. Put on that armor. Don't neglect what God's given you. Put on that armor. Amen. You say, what is the armor? And we could go through and it would take more time. But and, we'll go, and we're going to cover it. But read Ephesians chapter 6 there from verse 12 on. And it talks about the armor of God. What God has given to a Christian. And why do we have the armor? Look there, 13. He says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So for a Christian in this battle to make it, for a Christian to, to make it through, he's got to, number one, be saved. Amen. You've got to be saved. You've got to be born again to the brethren. And then you've got to be strong in the Lord. You've got to have the power of His might. And then you've got to put on the whole armor of God. And then notice verse 12. This is where I drew the conclusion of the statistics. Look what it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See, your battle, this is why it's an unseen war. It's not flesh and blood. When somebody offends you, your battle's not with the one that is offended. Realize there's, a, there's something else at work. Sometimes we're so quick to blame others. We get offended. Well, they offended me. My friend, it's the devil that's at work. You're not wrestling. You're not fighting. You're not striving against flesh and blood. You're striving against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Too often we focus this battle on flesh and blood, on those around us, on people, on our brothers or sisters in Christ when maybe, they've, maybe we've had a bad day or maybe we've had a tough time or maybe something's not quite what it should be and we begin to wrestle with each other. And we forget that the real battle lies without, not uh, in the flesh and blood, but, it, rely, but it, it, uh, it dwells in principalities and powers. It's the devil. It's the flesh. It's this world that we're at battle against not flesh and blood. Don't lose sight of where the battle is. Don't lose sight of where God has called you to stand. God's not called you to stand necess uh, as far as God has not called you to fight against one another. Now we're to stand for truth. Amen. We're to stand for righteousness. And sometimes that means that we have to stand against somebody else. But realize that what it is, is there's a greater matter to stand against. It's not necessarily because it's flesh and blood we stand, but it's because what they symbolize. In other words, we stand at this church against homosexuality. That stand that we have is not against people, it's against sin. Sometimes people get confused and think, well, you hate me. No, I love everybody, but I hate sin. I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood. I'm wrestling against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The church does not take a stand against the people, but against the principles. But what happens is, is the people symbolize those principles, and so we must stand against people at times. But realizing that it, if they decide to get right, this is what the blessing is. Maybe somebody's wrong. But when they decide to get right, we can forgive. Why? Because we're not against you. We're against the principles. We're against that position. Amen. That's what we're against. That's what we're fighting against. Too often we get focused on people, and then when people decide to get right with God, or maybe a fellow brother in Christ backslides and and becomes an enemy of the Lord for a time and then decides to get right with the Lord. But we've so put in our minds that we're fighting against Him that we can't forgive. God says it's not about the flesh and blood. Amen. But sometimes in your stand for truth and in your stand for right, it will be against people. 
But realize it's not the people. That's not what makes it important. It's because it's the Word of God. We stand for God's truth. Amen. So don't lose the focus. Put on the whole armor of God, but don't wrestle against flesh and blood. A lot of times as a pastor, some ask me, they say, you know, why do you, why do you, uh, they, and again, we go back, they say, why do you hate people? And I say, we don't hate people. We hate sin. But when people are the advocate of sin, then I'm going to fight. Well, if you want to be the advocate of sin, if you want to be a sin's lawyer and try to defend it, then I'll fight you tooth and nail. I'll fight tooth and nail for righteousness. I'll fight tooth and nail for the Word of God. I'll fight tooth and nail for the principles of God's Word and for the church. But boy, it's only because of the position. But when somebody wants to get right or somebody says, you know what, you're right. Then boy, we can take them with open arms and love them not be because we're not fighting against them, we're fighting against the devil. Amen. So we see an unseen battle. It's a tough war. You've been enlisted. You didn't even know it. You got saved and thought, man, I didn't know I was getting into this. But boy, let me tell you a few things about this battle and then we'll be done. Number one, it's a necessity. This battle's a necessity. This war that you're in, it's necessary. You think, well, man, you know, why are we doing this? Why do we fight? Why do we stand? I'll tell you why. There's children. I'll tell you why. For a good church. I'll tell you why. For the greatest reason of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a necessary battle because there are those that would wish to demean the very Savior that we've trusted for our salvation. And I tell them over my dead body. It's a necessary battle. Don't lose sight that this battle is necessary. Don't get discouraged and think, well, why do we have to do this? Happened during the Vietnam War where some thought it unnecessary and the men that gave and sacrificed their life were met with hostility in their own country. People lost sight of why we fought. Sad to say, but then those that fought were treated as criminals. Christians were the very same way. People do not understand why we fight. People do not understand why we take a stand. People, mom and dad, are not going to understand why you discipline and why you go to church and why you bring your children and why you do all that you do. They may not see it and you may be met with hostility. But never lose sight of how necessary that battle is. Because one day those same people will turn around and say, you know what, you were right. Thank you. One day on a memorial day, somebody will say, I'm glad they fought. The same people that mocked and cursed will one day turn around and thank you for freedom. And the same people that one day may spit in your face and tell you, how dare you take a stand, how dare you fight, will one day be glad that you gave them the gospel. Your children that may not understand at the time being and think, why, mom and dad, do you keep me from this and this? And they get a little bit aggravated and rebellious, but I promise you one day they'll turn around and bless you for keeping them and for fighting. It's a necessary battle. Never lose sight of how necessary it is to fight. It's, it, 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 it's a great need. Our country has to have it. We can't just be like every other mediocre and just give in. We've got to fight. Never let that drive be, uh, be taken away. Never let somebody discourage you and make you think it's not worth it. My friend, it's worth every bit of it. It's worth every second, every minute that we give fighting. Number two, realize the danger of battle. There's a danger in fighting. The danger is that when you fight, you may, it may cost you something. It's going to cost you to fight. It may cost you time. It may cost you finances. It may cost us our very life. But boy, as God says, fear not them that can kill the body, but he that can kill the soul. The danger of battle is that we may lose something. It may cost us. But as every soldier lays down his life and understands the dangers that he's going to face, equally he understands 
that it's worth every danger and even giving his life. As a Christian, we may face in, in, the, in the near future, we may face persecution. We may face being ridiculed. We may face all that. And there's dangers that may come up against the man of God or the church and the people of God may be faced with hard times. It's a danger. But boy, it's worth it. It's necessary, but understand that it's going to cost. Understand it is a sacrifice. But just as that soldier lays down his life, he says the danger is worth it because of a love for my country. My dear friend, every danger that we'll face as a Christian is worth every bit of it for the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then last, the reward of battle. The reward of battle. It's necessary... It's dangerous, but boy, it sure brings a great reward. It sure brings a great reward. What's that reward? Well, one day the Bible says there is a crown in heaven. There's a well done, thou good and faithful servant. There's a promise to parents, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Many promises in God's word that God's given time after time as a reward for a Christian that fights this unseen war. It's a battle. But realize this. Last thing, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verse 24. Verse 23, I'm sorry. And he says, And he called unto them, and he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, strong man and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith. So ever they shall blaspheme, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. I wanted to focus on verses 24, uh, 24 and 25, how that God says, lastly, when there's division, as we see, He says, if a kingdom against a kingdom or a house be divided against itself, it can't stand. And as Satan, if, in verse 26, if Satan is divided against himself, he cannot stand, but hath an end. Realize, and the last thing here is that if we're not together, if a church allows the devil to get in and cause division, as we saw as they did during the Civil War, we almost lost our country during that war. I don't know if you understand it, but our country almost came to an end because we were divided against ourselves. And God was giving us a truth that if in a home, if a house is divided against itself, it won't stand, they'll come an end. They'll come divorce. They'll come losing of the children. They'll come an end to that house. It can't stand. It'll fall. A kingdom, if divided against itself, won't stand. There'll be an end. If America continues to go on the road that she's going, I promise you there won't be an America very long. Because we can't be divided and stand. And my friend, as a Christian, as a church, if we're divided, if we allow the devil to get in and begin to root us and begin to cause division and allow us to sow discord in the brethren, then my friend, the Bible says that church can't stand and it will have an end. That's why it's so important to get in line with God's Word. That's why it's so important to, to not, uh, call, like the Bible says, sow discord among the brethren. Don't allow yourself to let the devil get in and cause you to be a divider. Cause you to think, well, maybe this or maybe that. Don't let the devil get in there. You, let, you, you line up behind the Word of God and you say it's God's Word, and that's the end of it. Too many times, many Christians have allowed themselves to be divided against 
the church. Be divided against the pastor. Be divided against maybe one another. And there comes an end to that person. Or there comes an end sometimes to a church. Last illustration will be done. Pastor friend of mine, Dr. Dean Miller, great man of God. He was preaching up at a church in uh, uh, Virginia, I believe. I can't remember and I apologize. Somewhere up north. I, I could get the name. But for sake of illustration, he was preaching and during the service, somebody stood up and began to mock him. Somebody stood up in the church and began to mock, the, mock Dr. Miller. He kept on preaching. Somebody else began to stand up. After it was all said and done, pretty much the church just ran him out. They didn't like what he was preaching. He was just preaching the Word of God, didn't like it, didn't care for it. And he told them, he said, My friends, be careful. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Not a week later, that church burnt to the ground. That church is no longer. Not because Dr. Miller is anything special, but my friend, as God says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. If we're divided against God, and we'll throw our face up at God, we'll throw our face up at the pastor, the God's man, or we'll throw our face at each other, then God says there'll come an end. God will put an end. Realize that we've got to be unified in our stand for Christ. Realize we've got to be willing to be unified. Amen. To agree, to get in line with the, with the pastor, to get in line with the church, to get in line with the Word of God, and go forward for Christ. But as long as we in our minds allow for there to be division, if we allow for there to be that small problem, then one day that will come out and God will root that out and there will come an end. Let's not let that be. I believe that God has great things in plan for the church. I believe God has great things in store for every person in this room. Boy, God wants to do something special. But how easily the devil can work his way in and cause division. And that can be the most destructive, as we saw. Civil war caused more damage than anything else, any other battle this country has. And nothing will cause more damage to a church than its own. Amen. Let's not let that be. Let's love God. Let's get behind God's word. Amen. And let's go on for Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, how much you spoke to my heart and even, Lord, uh, things that you... Uh, Lord, I didn't even see uh, really as I was studying and how that just preaching, Lord, you, Holy Spirit, speak to my heart and, and remind me of things that I didn't, even, I didn't even see while I was studying, how your truth is so evident. God, would you please help us to be, uh, to be Lord, uh, steadfast. Lord, this unseen war that we all face, it's serious, God. We've got to get in our minds that this isn't a game, amen. As the Bible says, Lord, or as the song says that Lester Roloff used to sing, that it's a battlefield, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. May, Lord, we be serious. May we enjoy our fellowship. May we have fun. But yet, Lord, may we be serious about the Lord Jesus Christ. May we, Lord, not allow the devil to get into our church, not allow the devil to get into our homes, and not allow the devil to get into our lives and cause division among us. May we, Lord, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Thank you, Lord, so much for these people, Lord, their love for you, God, and how that, Lord, I believe that most of these things, Lord, are already practiced. But, Lord, it's good to be reminded of. May we, Lord, come forward make a decision not to allow ourselves... Lord, to be divided against one another or divided against the church. May we, Lord, commit and submit ourselves to you, Lord, and, and trust you and follow you by faith. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the